A creek, by its very nature, is always a small part of something larger than itself. A creek is a humble thing, and yet, despite its modest size, it has the power to change its surrounding landscape, to refresh the life with which it comes in contact. This is Clear Creek. This unremarkable stream of water flows for several miles across northeast Oklahoma, in the heartland of America. But its scope extends far beyond this rural land. On the banks of Clear Creek, something extraordinary is happening. Here, a life is being lived that more closely resembles medieval times. A life that has never before been cultivated on American soil. Our Lady of Clear Creek Monastery is a Benedictine monastery in the Order of St. Benedict, which is about 15 centuries old. We're part of a congregation that uh, began in France in the 19th century after the French Revolution. This is a life focused on the liturgy. I would say that the Gregorian chant being a prayer, it is the life of the monk in a way. We celebrate uh, Mass according to the 1962 Roman Missal, which is often referred to as the Tridentine Rite. This is a life purely contemplative. When our Lord sit in heaven and the apostles are all looking up and the angels come and go, what are you gaping up for? Go. But, well, the monks stay there and gape. A life of prayer and work. This is the life of the monks of Clear Creek. It is countercultural. But what is the purpose of this seemingly insignificant group of religious men? Why have they settled in the Midwest United States? And what is at stake in this hidden life of silence and prayer? It's nearly five o'clock in the morning. Most of the world would still be sleeping at this hour. But for the monk, his day begins while it is still night. He meets with the other monks in community to pray the morning prayer called matins. This first hour of the divine office always occurs before daybreak and allows the monk to offer his day to God. With this, the monk begins the daily routine laid out centuries ago by a man named Benedict. Saint Benedict of Nursia was born into a noble family in Italy in the late fifth century. As a youth, Benedict abandoned his studies in Rome and lived as a hermit in a cave for three years. Once he emerged, he drew up a rule of monastic life, which outlined in 73 short chapters how to live a life centered on Christ through a balance of prayer and work. While the decadent culture of his time was crumbling around him, Benedict and his rule would help reform the church and lay the groundwork for the development of Western civilization.
the Benedictine way of life thrived for many centuries. Monasteries became centers of culture and learning. Sacred music was developed. Schools were founded. Scholasticism was born. Wherever these foundations took root, cities and villages soon sprang up around them. However, during the tumultuous centuries following the Protestant Reformation and the French Revolution, the order was nearly destroyed. So while it was in France that the Benedictine tradition was almost lost, Providence would have it that in France the order would be restored. In 1831, a French diocesan priest named Prosper Guéranger sought to repair the abandoned and defunct Benedictine priory of Salem, and, with the help of his local ordinary, purchased the property. Along with some fellow diocesan priests, he took Benedictine vows and dedicated his life to the restoration of the Benedictine order in France. He received this permission from Pope Gregory XVI, who then raised Salem to an abbey and named it the Mother House of the Benedictine Congregation of France. From the Congregation of Salem would flower some of the great priories and abbeys of our time. Most notably in this case is that of Fongambeau. Fongambeau is a small town situated on the River Creuse in the west of France. In 1091, a hermit began living in a cave here. Eventually, others joined the hermit, and they formed a monastery under the rule of St. Benedict. Over the centuries, Fongambeau became a vibrant and growing monastery, particularly during the medieval period. But, as was the fate of so many monasteries in France, the abbey at Fongambeau was nearly destroyed after the Protestant Reformation and never fully recovered. Eventually, an order of Trappist monks purchased the faltering property and occupied its buildings until their expulsion in 1905, when Fongambeau fell into private hands. And so it remained until 1948, when the Salem congregation once again put the abbey into Benedictine use. Today, with more than 60 monks, Fongambeau is the largest abbey in all the Salem congregation. Only a few decades after the Benedictines moved back to Fongambeau, the world entered a period of turbulence. Cultural revolutions began to dismantle the foundations of society. Not the least of this upheaval took place in the United States. Here, American culture and American Catholicism suffered in the changing times, leaving many people confused and many souls in the dark. Uninspired by the spirit of the age, three professors at the University of Kansas set up a humanities program to help guide students back to reality. The Pearson Integrated Humanities Program exposed the students to the liberal arts, not only by direct lecturing, but also through conversation and experience. Professors John Sr., Dennis Quinn, and Frank Nellick focused the program on the search for truth, goodness, and beauty. By their nature, these courses led many students to convert to the Catholic Church. Some students of the program would spend their vacations traveling to Europe to experience the roots of Western civilization. This particular group, though, uh, involves a nucleus of American college students who converted to the Catholic faith in the 70s, 1970s, and were looking for the right type of monastery to pursue their interest in the Catholic faith and found Foncambeau Abbey in France, which was flourishing at that time, many vocations, and they had a beautiful liturgy, beautiful setting. They were young converts who had gone to Europe to um, see a deeper Christian culture, Catholic, more Catholic society, really. And they heard about Foncambeau and went to visit and saw it was a very wonderful place and got a couple more of their friends to come and they stayed all winter and one of them entered and that was the beginning and over the years, every year, as long as this humanities program lasted, four or five boys at least would go spend the winter there, and every year one or two would enter. 
a lot of them left because it wasn't so easy to leave your country, et cetera. Not everybody had a vocation finally, of course. But there ended up seven from KU. It seems to be a very providential uh, path that led us uh, to Fonkambu. In the early 70s, there was much confusion in, in various communities. After the Second Vatican Council, there was a little bit of a questioning as to what religious life was all about and what there was a lot of uh, self, self searching, soul searching, I guess, and many communities experienced trouble. At Fonkambu, there was always a very great unity and they never really went through a crisis. And when the boys entered there, he said, you're entering, you become a monk at Fogambo. I can't promise you that we're gonna found the United States. The Lord may be leading us there, we'll see. So these boys entered to become monks at Fogambo. But I think we always knew that we would be coming back someday. We thought it'd be a little bit sooner, but we always, we always uh, remained attached to our own country, to America, and wanted to come back. So there was, the, there was this project to come to America. Many of us are from Kansas, and we sort of thought the Midwest might be the place. Property was considered in Oregon, in California. A very nice property was offered perhaps in uh, Tennessee, but uh, as things were not working out, some red tape was delaying all this, the Bishop of Tulsa positively asked us to come to this diocese in Tulsa. I was introduced to the monks soon after I became a bishop in 1994, and I uh, went to Fuancambeau, which is a place uh, uh, in France uh, where their monastery is, and uh, prayed with them. And then I discovered that they were uh, hoping to uh, build a monastery here in the United States. And uh, of course, I never even dreamed that they would consider Tulsa, Oklahoma. After the abbot uh, surveyed some of the parts of the United States, uh, he decided finally on Tulsa. A combination of factors, the blessing of the bishop, the fact that there are numerous friends around the area who wanted us to come, and then happening to find a very nice property in uh, Cherokee County, uh, about 70 miles east of Tulsa, made it happen. And so in 1999, uh, these original Americans with some French and Canadian brothers also came and established Clear Creek Monastery here in Oklahoma with the blessing of the Bishop of Tulsa, Bishop Slattery, and we began this adventure. At dawn, the monk offers praise to God in the office of lauds. As the sun ascends the horizon, the monk calls to mind the resurrection of Christ through hymns of praise. When the monks moved to Oklahoma in 1999, they were returning to their native soil and establishing the monastic life on what was once the western frontier of America. Affectionately, they refer to their new property as their Cowboy Bethlehem. We wound up here, and uh, that's just the reality. Oklahoma, there's still people in our time who remember the times when it was kind of the old, the old west around here. It was still uh, very late, the shootouts and the, the sheriff coming out. And there's been that kind of poetry of the, of the, the old west around here a little bit, the horses and the, and, and so that's just, that's part of the American soul. We, we found it very natural. And we kind of meet that and understand it. It, it joins the whole poetry of our childhood, the cowboy. And so here we're monks, you know. In the beginning we were riding horses a little bit. We had cattle, we still do, but we find it's a little tiresome to saddle the horses. We, we just go on foot now mostly. Like the cowboys of the Old West, these monks are pioneers, monastic pioneers establishing a life of purely contemplative Benedictine monasticism in a place which has not yet known this way of life. In America, in the early uh, days of monastic 
foundations in the 19th century, there was so much work to be done, so much evangelization, so many schools to be started that the monks naturally tended to take on apostolic works in addition to their monastic life. So they would have a, a religious life on, one, on the one hand and yet be engaged in parish work and teaching schools on the other. But our idea from the beginning was to bring back a more purely contemplative, just a simple monastic ideal which wasn't very much present in America, at least for men, at least for the Benedictine order, until now. I think we have to here to implant the monastic life as we, we live in France, according to the rule of Saint Benedict, as uh, Dom Guéranger uh, gave us, you know, in a, a tradition quite contemplative. Not unlike the setting of Fongambeau, Clear Creek is nestled on a quiet piece of land with peaceful surroundings. The property includes more than 1,000 acres of wooded land. In addition to the small creek from which the monastery draws its name, the landscape is blessed with prairies, hills, and bluffs, a little portion of God's creation that provides ample nourishment for the contemplative mind. The previous owners had equipped the land with two log cabins, several sheds, and a horse barn. When the monks first arrived at their new ranch, they had to adjust their lifestyle to the new setting. Our first monastery, really, the ch chapel was in a barn, uh, and the first monastic cells we built were the stalls of horses uh, had been there. We just put you know uh, walls around them a little bit and uh, fixed them up. And the abbot of Foncambeau said, you know about that, and his kind of. Uh, French aphorism, he said, well, uh, les chevaux se vont, les, les moines viennent. The horses are leaving and the monks are coming in. And that's, that was kind of the way it was, you know. At eight in the morning, a few hours after Lauds, the monks meet again in community to recite the office of prime. This office keeps the monk on task for his studies and work during the morning. After settling into their new monastery, the monks quickly found that rural Oklahoma was an ideal setting for the monastic life, particularly this form of monastic life with its focus on contemplation. Originally, monastic life was all contemplative. It was the only type of monastic life there was, really. The rule of St. Benedict, which is the most important monastic rule in the Western world, which really was, you might say, a key factor in the emergence of the European civilization, is a contemplative rule. It's, it's for uh, monks, that is say, men who live apart from society, who, uh, pray for the world around them, but live apart from the world, uh, devoting most of their time to prayer. The monastic ideal is, is just the gospel, be therefore perfect as your heavenly Father, per Father is perfect. You know, trying to pursue that in an organized manner. Every, every Christian is called to that perfection, but monks try to organize life so that it's easier to attain that perfection. But the central core, the nucleus of religious life really is always this contemplative dimension. And the world needs this witness the people that just live all for God and find and can, are content and that he can suffice. That's a very important witness in fact for our world. It's just a, really a life dedicated to the glory of God alone without any kind of a practical uh, goal. The real battle is a spiritual battle and the monks and the nuns, particularly in the way the contemporary is, are on the front line. It's um, um, we're very aware of every act we do. Um, uh, we have no distraction. We're very aware of what measure we're 
um, doing our acts purely, if they're for God or if there's egoism, we become very aware very quickly. And it's a real, every act is very, very spiritual for us, finally, really. We're very aware. And so what the monks do in a radical way is what we should all be doing. But we need them to show us how. One concrete condition of it all is silence. Being out here in the, in the countryside of Oklahoma, it's really very quiet at night and, and, and during the day too. And that's very helpful. The silence of the monastery preserves the atmosphere of the contemplative life. The monastery itself creates an enclosed courtyard called the cloister where the public is not allowed. There are parts of the cloister where the monk is prohibited from speaking. All the meals are taken in silence while a lector chants from a book or spiritual reading. All these things create for the monk an environment of contemplation. You are able to uh, concentrate on the contemplative life, on the prayer life, which you pray in the church continues in your mind and your, your heart the rest of the day as you work and do other activities. So silence is a concrete aspect of that. Terse is the third hour of the office after dawn. The monks meet in community to pray this office directly before the conventual high mass. To help facilitate the monastic prayer life, the rule of St. Benedict places special emphasis on the Opus Dei, or work of God, that is, the liturgy, the public worship of the Church. So our particular form of monastic life uh, is really centered on the liturgy. Uh, we uh, celebrate the hours of the divine office according to really the cosmic rhythm of the, the sun, the first hour, the third hour, the ninth hour. We're following the, the day, the, we're in, in tune with nature, you might say. Following the rule of Saint Benedict, the monk prays seven times a day and once at night. This is known as the Divine Office, or the Liturgy of the Hours, in which certain prayers and readings are recited during fixed hours of the day. The Office primarily consists of the Psalms, and also includes other scripture readings, hymns, and ecclesiastical readings. At Clear Creek, the monks sing the Divine Office in Gregorian chant in Latin. I would say that uh, Gregorian chant being uh, prayer, it is the life of the monk in, in a way. A monk being uh, a man that is uh, having a body and a soul is not pure spirit, needs to express himself outwardly and the chant is uh, an outward expression of prayer which incorporates uh, not only the, the single human person but the whole community. The whole community comes together and uh, expresses its faith and worships God uh, together. The liturgy in general is not only about the human person before God, it's finally Christ before his Father, Christ in his mission um, uh, of redemption. And he experienced all the, the sentiments of prayer of the ordered human soul, such as it, 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 uh, it finds itself before God. And this is really what uh, the liturgy and the chant is uh, trying to capture. Historically speaking, it was monks who saw the birth and development of Gregorian chant. And so, in the Western world, the two have always been tied together. After the monastic life was wiped out in France, it was natural that chant would play a key role in its restoration. 
Dom Guéranger, the restorer of Benedictine life in France, after it was completely extinguished in the uh, French Revolution, realized that, that the chant was very important for his idea, his project of uh, Benedictine life. Uh, the monk enters, uh, say, 12, 20 years of age. He spends his whole life in an enclosed community, and uh, his life is essentially one of prayer. Uh, and in order to, to be able to realize that, uh, the monk has to be able to have something uh, of quality to, to, um, to feed on and to, uh, to keep him uh, focused on God. Chant has always held a high place in the Salem tradition. In 1904, Pope St. Pius X charged the Salem congregation with the task of researching Gregorian chant throughout history and preparing an official Vatican edition of the church's chant. Continuing today, the French congregation remains the authority on Gregorian chant in the church. Gregorian chant is at the source of all Western music. And to the extent that we want to renew our music of today, especially the uh, music of the church, it's to Gregorian chant which we ought to look for inspiration. There was a lapse of time from the time I was ordained until just recently when I encountered the monks that I realized there was something missing. There was something missing in our worship. And I think uh, a good deal of it was, uh, was uh, Gregorian chant. The monks spend a great deal of time learning and practicing chant, but it is not in vain. The chant enhances the liturgy. It aids in the sacrifice of praise offered to God, fulfilling the rule, prefer nothing to the work of God. So it's our whole life, really. The, the liturgy is the thing we do. And uh, some days it's kind of a routine. You almost feel like in a, in a rut. You, you just, we're just there reciting the hours. And then sometimes it all comes alive. All of a sudden, the, the grace of the, of the moment of the liturgy takes a hold of the monk and his soul is lifted up and really participates all this to the fullest. It's uh, something that you have to live to really understand. You, know, you have to live it for a few years to see certain depths of prayer that are uh, just not accessible to someone who hasn't experienced that, usually, at least. The rule of St. Benedict places an importance on accepting guests as one would accept Christ. The monks at Clear Creek fulfill this commandment with joy. Guests and visitors are welcome to lodge at several of the facilities on the grounds. And, although the monks generally do not lead retreats, all are invited to take part in their prayer life. This is something that anyone, any layman, can come and experience to some extent in our monasteries because we open up widely our doors to guests and they can come for a stay for a few days and live the liturgy with us, you know. Uh, and it's really a treasure for the whole church, but someone has to sort of be doing it uh, ex professo as, as the, uh, the ones whose specialty it is. And that's kind of our, our, our uh, vocation is being, uh, living the liturgy. While the monks arrange their day around the eight canonical hours of the divine office, their most important work is the offering of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The Holy Eucharist is the, is the very center of it all. The rest is a kind of cortege that sort of surrounds the uh, sacrifice of Mass, the Holy Liturgy. At Clear Creek, Mass is offered twice daily. In the early morning, low Masses are offered on the many side altars of the crypt church, each priest offering a private low Mass. At the high altar, another priest offers a low Mass for the public. Later in the morning, following terse, conventual high Mass is offered on the high altar. We're extremely happy that we have been able to 
retain this extraordinary form of the uh, Roman Rite. It just seems to fit with our life very well. But what we want to celebrate really is the Catholic liturgy. Uh, we have as monks a particular affinity uh, to the Latin liturgy. Uh, the Council of Vatican II asked that the Latin be retained as the liturgical language of the church. Pope Paul VI specifically asked the Benedictines to keep the Latin, and so we always did. We uh, are not totally opposed to, to change. We, we see some good elements in the liturgical reform. We use some of the new prefaces with permission from Rome. We have a few uh, of the elements of the new missal. It's just the old missal, I suppose, was really kind of Benedictine in spirit. It really uh, has a very uh, austere but very great beauty. It seems good that some places preserve this uh, kind of integral Latin liturgy, and we're just the right people to do that. We just have always felt that there was something there that shouldn't be lost, and many wise persons agreed with us, and we sort of held that line against, sometimes against, an awful lot of opposition, and now we're happy to see it being widely accepted, and, and we feel that without uh, being you know, intransigent, uh, we can hold on to something there that's just part of the life of the Roman Catholic Church. At the noon hour, the monks meet again for prayer, this time for the office of sext. This hour is placed in the middle of the day, between periods of work and study. Prayer and work. This is the Benedictine motto, ora et labora. The work component of the motto is a necessity in the life of the monk. Well, one reason for the success of the rule of St. Benedict was its balanced nature, that it, it uh, really uh, lays out a daily routine that is good in, con in conformity with human nature. Uh, the early monks in Egypt found that if they tried to pray all day long, they would uh, go crazy. It's impossible for human nature, uh, but if they would do a little manual labor during the day, alternate with prayer, then their prayer life would be better and they would have a better balance. And the rule of St. Benedict takes this into consideration. One of the keys to our monastic life, uh, as uh, all of monastic history has shown, is the, the necessity to, to moderation of keeping a balance. And that's what basically Ora and Labora is about. Uh, not only do we pray, we need to work with our hands and it's only with a certain balance of work with our hands, other work with our minds also, and reading to, um, to, to nourish our prayer. This has always been important for Benedictine monasticism, and uh, it's part of our, our heritage. Generally, there are about eight hours of work, eight hours of prayer and study, and eight hours of rest. Our work is meant to be a kind of extension of the prayer. Our ideal is to pray at all times, really. We pray seven times during the day and once at night. Uh, and the manual labor is, is, is a way of kind of peacefully continuing the prayer, but letting the body, the human nature, the physical nature have its uh, realm to exercise in. The monks have taken advantage of the variety of landscapes on the property 
and continue to use the land as a ranch. Our work has developed. We have a wood shop that's very active. We're building furniture. We uh, also make cheese and, and certain products with milk from our dairy cattle. Along with chickens and cattle, the monks at Clear Creek also raise sheep. The shepherd monks use traditions they learned from their French roots to raise and pasture the sheep. The monks have developed their wood shop using timber from the vast amounts of wooded area on the property. They also have a metal shop where the monks sometimes receive assistance from local neighbors. There is an orchard and a garden. We, we benefit from a lot of benefactors when it comes to buildings and, and uh, these expenses that are beyond our means, but for our daily, day-to-day -day, uh, needs, we can pretty much provide for them by our manual labor, and it's a healthy uh, situation in that sense. In an effort to keep the balance of work and prayer, and for the monastery to run effectively, it is necessary to have two different categories of monks. All the monks are monks. Their first uh, duty is prayer, the spiritual life. Uh, but within the monastic community, there is quite a diversity. There are basically two groups, the, the, the choir monks, so-called choir monks, who devote a little more time to prayer uh, than the brothers, the converse brothers, who have a little more time for manual labor. The choir monks generally study for the priesthood and become priests, but not, not always, but generally. And the brothers uh, receive a complete formation in monastic life, but do not uh, engage in any specifically clerical studies, philosophy, or theology. And there are many different types of officers in the monastery. There's someone in charge of economic questions, the bursar. Uh, there is a monk in charge of the linen room. There are monks in charge of the kitchen, supplies. Uh, many roles are played, really, and uh, all the talents are necessary uh, in order to make the monastery run correctly. Between the prayer and work, the monks also allow some time each day for healthy recreation. Recreation we have together. We, uh, we walk and talk. That's um, our style. Uh, the recreation is um, a little bit prolonged on, on feast days, and on Thursdays we have a long walk which lasts about three hours. Uh, we just, it helps us to unwind. the ninth hour of the day, non. The monks meet for mid-afternoon office to commemorate the death of Christ and to ward off the temptation of laziness amidst their work. As they have done throughout the day, the monks meet for this office in the choir stalls of the church. Contemplative monks require a certain setting in order for their life to thrive. When the monks came to Oklahoma, they knew their ranch was only temporary. Well, the old barn where we moved in was a kind of our cowboy Bethlehem. It was just the way it was when we got there and we adapted to it. It was very nice, but it didn't meet the needs of a contemplative community of monks. The first principle of the buildings really is the spiritual reality at the heart of it all. The prayer life, you know, which is led in common though, so with a community of men, not hermits, but a community. And that requires a certain uh, peace, a certain separation from the world, from the busyness of the world. And you have to have quite a few number of room, you have quite a few rooms, which we call cells for the monks. You have to have the conventional places, the, the chapter room, the refectory. And uh, for that all to uh, fit into the harmony of a real Benedictine abbey, such as existed in the Middle Ages, it takes quite a, a bit of space. We were living in a ranch, you know, um, and you need a place appropriate for your life, particularly monastic life. We were a little too open. Now we're 
not quite in a church yet. We're in the crypt of the future church, but it's, it's well proportioned and you can sing in there well. It's bigger. So just the whole atmosphere, it's very important. It's like your habit, really, you know, um, you're not. Habit doesn't make the monk, but it certainly helps, and so do monastic buildings, so. The uh, Franciscan idea of poverty is sort of to have nothing on earth, which is a very beautiful thing, a very radical choice. The Benedictine idea is more to have everything, but to consecrate it to God, to have uh, orchards, to have fields, to have buildings, but for God, not for us. Each monk is totally poor, doesn't own anything. But we have these sort of elaborate spaces, really, though, just to favorize the contemplative life and the peace and harmony of our life. The goal of the monks is to build a monastery that will last a thousand years. In order to achieve this goal, the monks hired architect Thomas Gordon Smith to design the monastery in a classical style. The $24 million project will include a large abbatial church and a cloistered residence. A fair portion of this project has already been realized. In 2003, groundwork was laid for the crypt of the church. The monks have been using this crypt for their liturgical functions. In the few years following, significant progress was made on the residence building. In January 2008, after nine years of living in sheds and barns on their ranch, the monks were finally able to move in to their new residence. And so we were kind of attached to it. It was a little bit sad to leave the, the first monastery because it was our, you know, our first time here. But it really was too small and uh, uh, lacking in that, uh, that type of structure that makes our, our kind of separation from the world more uh, tangible. You know, we don't leave the world in the sense of leaving everyone behind. We take everyone with us in our heart, but we need to be a little bit separated from the, the uh, busyness of the world in order to be contemplatives, and that's what we have here. When the Bishop of Tulsa came for the official blessing ceremony in April 2008, it was an emotional day for all involved. This marked a milestone in the life of the monks at Clear Creek an event which would establish their stability in Oklahoma for years to come. It was a joyful event. It was, uh, uh, an, it was an event that was looked forward to for a long, long time. And, uh, and the fact that the monks were able to raise the money to build this beautiful monastery is, uh, is amazing. And it shows how much people really want to, uh, to make sure that they succeed. The monastery is being built in a multi-phase process. Currently, the crypt of the future church is complete, as well as one wing of the residence, which includes the kitchen, refectory, chapter room, and parlors. The next phase is to build the large abbatial church. The key feature of any abbey or monastery is the church, which serves as the central point of the community. The final stage will complete the remaining portions of the residence. We already need, we're already packed. We're going to start putting sheds out for some of the monks very soon, probably. So we really need another building, a uh, living quarters building, but we want to build the church first. It's just, that's the center of the life here. As the sun begins to set on the horizon, the monks meet before dinner for Vespers. After working and studying all afternoon, the monks close the day with this evening office. The monks have made significant progress since they arrived on the banks of Clear Creek in 1999. Their numbers have increased from nine monks to more than 35. They have moved from their modest ranch to the foundation of their monastery residence. 
they continue to cultivate the spiritual soil on which they have set foot. And as they look toward the future, they are very hopeful. The most important thing is, is to construct the community, the, the living edifice, the living stones to, uh, uh, we hope to attain perhaps the number of 60 or 70 monks here. I think uh, the community uh, will uh, grow about uh, 60 months, you see. It is uh, the good, uh, the good uh, balance for a community. That's a good number. We can have a, you know, a good choir and fully developed our little works, whatever they are. I mean, everything we do, uh, carpenter shop, uh, metal works and everything but not too big. We're still family. You know everybody. You can see Father Superior easily. So, and the idea being, we'd 60, and we get to 70, we start another monastery. It's a difficult life. It's a life of great sacrifice. It's a life of total commitment to prayer and work. And, um, and God only calls certain people to this way of life. Uh, but it seems as though he's calling quite a few and they're listening, and they're responding. And when they visit the monastery, and they see the monks who are there, they see something they've never seen before. They see a peace and a joy. Despite the difficult life of hard work, silence, and prayer, they're filled with joy. Not what the world would expect, but their lives are based on faith. They're going to have an effect, an influence on this country and on this diocese. They already have, and that, that influence will continue. I know here it is uh, quite new, but uh, we have to in, take inspiration from friends and from our, our tradition. But it's God's secret exactly what's going to happen. The, the real story is the story of grace, the vocations. Each human being, each vocation is a little world in itself. There's no telling what could happen. We, we don't know. But we know that if we follow the rule of St. Benedict, which is just a kind of monastic echo of the Gospel, well then good things will happen and that we'll be blessed. You know, we'll have the cross. We expect the cross. We've been perhaps too blessed so far. I'm expecting, <laughs> expecting uh, something that seems too easy in a way. But we have worked very hard and we have had our crosses and expect that too. And that's just part of the program, you know. So we're just ready for whatever God wants to send us, you know, as best we can. What, what's needed in America now is uh, men and women are committed to prayer. And uh, it's not just for monks, it's for all of us. But we need monks to remind us that that's primary. We feel that all Christians should be a little bit monk. Uh, every, every Catholic in particular, you know, has a sense of the fullness of the doctrine, uh, should try to live a little bit like the monks, and then the monks should do it completely. It's just their, their duty to, to pray without ceasing. Compline is the final office of the day. With this hour, the monks bring their day to completion. They offer thanksgiving for the day and pray that they will be safeguarded through the night. It was the monastic life that helped build Western civilization. And so this monastic life is a necessary component of the restoration of Christian culture. The life of the monks at Clear Creek will have an impact on society. The grace of God is at work in this life, and it is this grace that will gradually change the world, so that minds and hearts may be lifted, so that fetters may be broken, so that order may be restored, so that in all things God may be glorified. Sunday.